Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Chris LeCompte, although you may have known me as referee or Mr. Official throughout the years. Today, Mario Nasta joins me one more time for the final installment of this three-part series on assistant refereeing. Mario is going to give us his seven steps to be a better AR. For more examples and analysis of each of these steps, please watch ARing 211, where Mario and I will go into further discussion about each of these steps, giving examples from our own past about how we've used these steps or how these steps would have improved our assistant refereeing at the time. For an explanation of the rules ARs need to know that govern beaters and their bludgers, please see ARing 101 or ARing 111. For an explanation of how and when to make these calls and the appropriate ways to make these calls, please watch ARing 102 or ARing 112. Now let's dive in. Here are the seven steps to being a better AR by Mario Nasta. Mario, thank you for joining and for imparting your knowledge upon the world. My pleasure. Anything we can do to uh, increase the AR pool, increase the skill level, this is good for the sport. Um, yeah, so I wanted to start things off uh, just talking about kind of the breakdown of a ref crew across the board. I think it's something that isn't discussed enough um, and sometimes can be a little confusing, especially for newer refs, what they should have each of their refs doing, um, whether it's a newer HR or a newer AR themselves. Um, but yeah, so overall, uh, what I found the most effective is going to be your HR right there. They're controlling, they've got the whistle, they're, they're in charge of kind of the, the overall pace of the game more than anyone else. They should be watching the Quaffle game um, predominantly and, and kind of keeping the peripherals of, of the beater game in their focus, uh, but really specifically watching the ball carrier in the Quaffle game so that they can kind of educate fouls and stop and start play as, as, as they need. The LAR on the flip side should be also watching the Quaffle game for the most part, um, but looking more at the off ball chasers, getting that secondary perspective in the Quaffle game so that between the HR and the LAR, if they're spread out on opposite sides of the field, they really get an entire encompassing view of what's going on with the Quaffle carriers um, and just anybody kind of pushing or, or shoving on the sidelines at anywhere near the sides. That leaves the space for the ARs. Uh, to be specifically focusing in on the beat game, right? Um, if you're an AR, you, it's synonymous with beat ref for most people for a reason. You should be watching the beaters, seeing what's going on, watching the bludgers, really paying attention to that half of the game. Then finally, you've got your goal refs. They should be, you know, no matter what, in a position where they can see if a, a shot goes in one of the hoops. That is their number one priority at all times. While they're doing that, they can look for any, you know, minor fouls and things like that and, and watch a quaffle to see if it goes off the boundary line to put their hand up and kind of signal to help out the head ref. But really, their number one goal at all times should be watching to see if a ball went in the hoop or not. Lastly, you've got the snitch ref. They should be watching the snitch. Really self-explanatory. No matter what, they need to put themselves in a position where they can tell if a catch is good or not. Uh, they should be leaning on the ARs in the area to really advocate a lot of those beat calls so they can be focusing primarily on the snitch itself. Right, as a snitch ref, I find that most snitch refs can handle the seekers and the snitch runner, but once any beaters start entering or two beaters start battling, it's impossible to watch both the seekers, the snitch runner, and also watch that. So it's really helpful when ARs shift over to help watch that kind of stuff. Yeah, 100%. As an AR during stitch on pitch, you need to migrate and support your stitch rep as much as possible, right? It's it's not their responsibility to ever be calling out beats. They are, they are there for the snitch. You need to go in and play your part with that part of the game. Right, snitch refing is a full-time job on sound. 100%. So your first tip here is to move. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, there is no feeling worse for a coach or a captain on the sideline of the game than to turn to the field and see a AR or an L any ref really just standing still in a corner of the pitch when the ball's on the other half, right? Um, there's there's no excuse for it. It's not just a, a Quidditch thing, it's an any sport thing, right? If you're there as a ref, you're there to make calls. To do that, you need to see what's happening. And to see what's happening, you need to be near the play. Right? It's, it's just right. that simple. None of us are none of us are birds. We don't have don't have the vision to see it from the other end of the field. You gotta you gotta hop on your horse and get down to the other end as the ball moves back and forth. Um, with that in particular, uh, like to talk about a little bit about positioning when it comes to ARs. Obviously, you want to be moving up and down the field every single play as the ball switches from offense to defense. Um, 
in the AR game, at the beginning of the game, you should touch base with your peers uh, if you're on the same side, right? Um, and there's two of you. One of you should always be at the in line with the beaters closest on defense closest to hoops. The other should be in line with the offensive beater um, closest to half, right? Kind of be at the boundary lines, the edges of where the beater game is. One of you watching, you know, more defense focused, the other watching more offense focused. So you can truly encompass and observe everything that happens in the beater game. Um, on the, on the flip side, if you're by yourself, which often happens, especially during maybe central pitch or things like that as the game transitions, try to be as centered in the middle of the play as possible, or try to look for an area of the field where you see two beaters near each other from opposing teams, because that's the most likely area for a play to occur, and, and you obviously want to be watching for those kinds of situations. Right, and uh, to add a shameless plug-in, uh, you can look at my video on positioning if it seems too daunting or too complex at first to you know constantly looking for which beater is where um, you can also use the field lines as uh, sort of a half measure towards getting to this optimal goal so if you're the if you if there's another person on your side of the field you should definitely be crossing midfield um as you as you move up with a team as they transition going uh, forward on offense and if you're further down closer to the defensive side you might shift all the way down to the goal line um, just so you can get those yep. two angles on the pitch. Completely agree, and I, I do support that plug. You guys should watch more of Chris's videos if you're watching this one. Just watch the rest. Um, yeah, and I think the, the last point I want to make as far as movement, you need to be watching, right, the beaters just as much as the bludgers. Artie, your next ad, uh, piece of advice for ARs is to watch the beaters and their balls. Yeah, so we, we kind of touched it a little bit at the end there, but I, I really wanted to make its own slide to, to, to stress this, right? Not just the beaters, also their balls all the time, right? Um, at the end of the day, we talked about the HR and the LAR, right? And one of them is watching the quaffle, the other one's watching off-ball chasers. You're just as likely to get or see a foul um, with beaters without bludger as you are to see with beaters with a bludger, right? It's a physical game, it's a contact sport. People are gonna be pushing, shoving. So watch for the ball that's on the ground, watch for the beaters moving around towards it. Make sure you're in the area to make a call. In addition, I need to stress this again because I know we touched it early, but if you are an AR, your job is the beaters and their balls. Your job is not the quaffle. Your job is not seeing if a goal went in or not. You're not your job is not on stitch on pitch, seeing if a catch was good. Your job is seeing if the person was beat before or not, right? That's that's your number one thing. You got to watch the beaters, watch the balls that are in the air, and make sure you're able to make a call every time. Um, the the one of the worst feelings as a player in this sport, especially as a beater in this sport, is to see is to is to hit someone square in the side, square in the chest, right? They keep playing, and you turn to a ref and they're like, "My guy," and they're just like, oh, "I wasn't watching." I'm like. So why are you here? That's, that's your only job is to watch. Like, come on. Like, you need to be there. You need to be watching the beaters of the balls. You need to just push that chaser game out of your head as much as you can. Right. Like, 50% you're mad at the person who's just ignoring a beat. But also, hey, ref. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you? Yeah. It's 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 pretty pretty demoralizing as a player to, to make a play know you did something, have it be very effective in, in the overall grand scheme of things, and to turn to a ref to try and get support and then just be like, yeah, I wasn't watching. It just, I was I was distracted. Like, that's that's really rough. Next up, uh, your next piece of advice for assistant refs is to talk. Yeah, so um, oddly enough, seeing a foul doesn't do anything for players if you don't talk about it, right? Um, seeing a beat, doesn't actually mean that the player's gonna get off broom unless you say B, right? Um, super, super important, not just for ARs, for any ref, to enunciate and be very, very loud and vocal at all times when you're on the pitch, right? Um, I'm, I'm a loud person by nature, but some people who, who step into the refing field aren't, right? They're not used to it. They don't, they don't maybe have to yell at a bunch of employees every day because they're in a big warehouse and people can't hear, right? I'm, I'm used to it because that's that's just the nature of, of my career right now. But if you don't come from a sports background or you, you don't come from uh, a work background where you have to speak loudly to large groups on a regular basis, right? You might not be used to projecting your voice, right? Um, as a ref, that is paramount. Um, 
players are, are going crazy. There's a million things happening. There's literally four balls on the field at all times, right? If you're not loud, there are many times where a beater or who's a chaser, anybody really, could get skimmed by a ball, have no idea. It's not really expected for them to feel every single one. And if you're not loud and telling them, they're, they're just going to keep playing and, and it can quickly move to a position where maybe that player is now impacting play illegally in no way, shape or form their fault because they just couldn't hear and couldn't tell. It is your job to kind of prevent those situations, really be loud, get in their face if you can, right? Wave at them, do something, but use their number. If you know their name, use the name. I know a lot of times you might not, but like anything you can do to get the information across that person, really try to do it, right? That is ultimately our job as beat refs is to be as vocal as possible and make sure people know when they've been beat. Also on the flip side, make sure your safe calls and things like that, your no foul calls are just as loud as your foul calls. Um, oftentimes it can be really difficult for a beater in the middle of a duel to like know whether they were safe or, or beat. Don't make them guess, right? Like that, that, that's bad for both people involved in the, in, in the interaction, right? The person who threw it is like, are we good? Am I able to go for the ball? The person who's hit is like, can I keep playing? Like, it's really, really important to, to make it clear to everybody as soon as possible. Your next piece of advice is to use back to hoops. Yeah, so I think this gets brought up every once in a while, um, in AQD, IQA, all, all kinds of forms, but I think it's something that really needs to be touched on and explained to refs um, as they come into the sport, as they come into really any sport, not just Quidditch, but it's, it's really big for for um, Quidditch specifically because of kind of the way a lot of our fouls are educated. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't be calling every single foul you see, right? Um, our goal as a ref is to facilitate a safe, fun, and enjoyable playing and fair playing experience for both teams, right? Um, all of those things are important, not just the, the fair part, um, not just the safe part, but also the enjoyable part, right? The, the pace of the game is important. Letting people play the game is important. You, you can't make the game about yourself. You can't be out there just to try and give as many cards as you want, just to try and prove you know the rules as, as, as well as anybody else, right? That's, that's not your job. Right, so when would you give a card? Um, great call. So a couple times that you should be giving a card um, pretty much no matter what. Um, top one is when the interaction affected play in a serious way, right? At the end of the day, intent can be important and it cannot be important. Like, you, you can have your opinions on intent, but at the end of the day, if something somebody did affected the game, affected the play in a serious manner, like stopped a team from being able to score, um, stopped a turnover, stopped a, a opportunity for a fast break, you need to stop play, you need to educate a foul, need to give the proper turnover and allow that team who got fouled uh, a more fair chance to actually proceed with the game. That's that's one. Next one um, would be repeat offenses, right? So like I said, I want you guys to use back to hoops, use um, just the no harm, no foul, that kind of stuff. Use warnings as much as you can. That only goes so far. If you warn someone once or twice on a minor foul and there's it's your third or fourth time going for it, you need to give a card, right? Um, even if it doesn't affect play much each individual time. Getting an extra step towards rolling a ball back to your own hoops four times, like it matters, it slows down play for the other team. It it slowly wears on the other team is like, hey, I know it didn't really affect right now, but like I'm having to do this every single time. That's unfair, that's not what should be happening. So, so at a certain point, right, usually after two or three, uh, or usually on the second or third time for one of those minor fail, fouls, I'll, I'll stop and be like, nope, you've been warned, you're getting a card here. And then the last point you have here about uh, reckless play? Yeah, so that's that's really important. Um, as a athlete, it is your job to control yourself in a reasonable manner while playing, right? You should never be putting yourself or other players in a dangerous situation through your actions, right? So. Whether that means, you know, diving towards a quaffle on the ground as someone was winding up for a kick, right? It's similar to soccer, right? You put your head for like, if you're trying to head a ball while someone's in the motion of kicking, it's dangerous, not because you're putting them at risk, but because you're putting yourself at harm and forcing them to try and change what they're doing. Um, or if you're just, you know, blindly, recklessly charging at somebody, trying to hit them and not caring how you're controlling yourself, right? Anytime your actions could 
under most normal circumstances result in an injury or would likely result in injury or just a general dangerous area of play, a foul should be educated because that player is not playing with a safe mindset, right? It right. is everybody's job to take safety seriously. Um, it's everybody's job to control themselves. If you're playing dangerously or recklessly, you should be called for it and you should be getting a card. Like those are things that can't be acceptable because, you know, safety has to be number one. Like obviously fairness and enjoyability are important for a sport. Safety is the top one when it comes to a contact sport for sure. One thing I want to point out that I really like that you added because I've made this call exactly only once, but I feel like most refs don't know it, is that playing dangerously doesn't just mean putting other people at danger. If you're yep. putting yourself at danger, the referees can and should adjudicate a foul against you. You should not, you should not be putting yourself at, at risk. Um, yeah, I actually, I got I got that card, not footage, uh, in soccer in, in high school. I kind of laid out and dove to try and head a ball that like a guy was literally in the process of winding up to kick. And like, he didn't hit me, which was, was nice of him, but I 100% put myself in a dangerous position there. I put him in a position where he had to either just like abruptly stop his action or hurt me. Like it, it wasn't a good choice. I, I mean, I was, I, was a, I was a kid. I was just trying to hit the ball, right? But it's not smart, and it should 100% be called out and educated. Now, next in big bold letters here, confident, <laughs> and I cannot express how much I agree with you here. Yeah. So, um, some some everybody who's ever gone to RPI and played with me should know uh, confidence is key. Right in, in all things, um, as a player, as a ref, in life in general, right, you should be confident. But specifically to refing, you you need to have confidence in what you're doing. Um, the players shouldn't be making the calls, right? That's that's our job as refs. We need to be doing that. You shouldn't you shouldn't be swayed by what the players are saying. And so as far as you going to start a call, and once you've made a call, you shouldn't be swayed by what they're saying to either take it back or to not call it. Right. right. Uh, What's the point of you being even being there if you're just going to listen to what the players say? Hundred percent. Right. Uh, your job is to, is to go into that game and to present a, a bastion of control. Right. You need to be there to confidently educate and control the game. If it starts with the refs, right? If as far as a game getting out of hand, getting nitty gritty, we've all been there. We've all seen games where you know one team's a little physical the other team gets a little emotional and goes back and forth and things can kind of explode and elevate all the way up to like just you know like fights and things like that a lot of that can be prevented by quick swift and confident action from a ref right if you present yourself as like no this is what's happening you need to stop a lot of times people respond to that authority that confidence with de-escalation right that's obviously you're going to get those one-offs where people go nuts but like it's going to really prevent a lot of those issues and um, it's going to instill a level of trust in the ref group, which is really important, right? Um, very, very often, right, coaches and captains will turn to a ref and be like, hey, did you see that? Hey, to an inexper inexperienced beat ref, and like, why, why aren't you watching that? What are, and if you turn back with anything other than a, I saw it, it wasn't a foul, I'm paying attention. If you turn back with a, oh, I, I didn't think, uh, like, you're going to get yelled at for the rest of the game. And that's bad for two reasons. One, you know, it's going to distract you from what's going on. Two, you're just, you know, upsetting an entire half of the game for no reason, right? And it, and you might have been right the entire time, but if you didn't present it in that fashion, if you didn't present it with confidence, it's going to lead to a lot of that just back and forth between you and, and players or you and coaches. I will say this, um, as a ref, and I, th I don't think I actually put this anywhere, but I think it's an important to note. Just because you've made a call, just because you've communicated it, doesn't mean you're right right and the players and the coaches do deserve a chance to say something about it right as a ref you shouldn't be sitting there thinking hey if i do my job right nobody should talk to me and i, I don't have to listen to them. you should be open to feedback during a game and at the end of the game the way that should happen is if they bring something to you listen keep the conversation short and end it with thank you i'll watch for it or thank you i'll 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 be looking for that like something in that manner that lets them know you've heard them and you're actually thinking about it for the rest of the game right doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out of your way to do any of that but like there will be times where a ref um or a, a coach i should say comes up to me as a ref and says hey can you watch um the other team i don't think they're fully dismounted right whether or not they're they're right about that i will you know check on the other team just just 
do a quick glance, make sure the next couple plays as they're, they're getting off the room, I'll take a look. I'm not gonna change the way I've been refing. If I saw something earlier, I would have called it. If I saw something later, I'll call it. But you can still kind of look out for it, right? You're not gonna be playing perfect every game. You're not gonna be refing perfect every game. Take the advice when you get it and keep the game moving. Your next piece of advice is for them to stick to the facts. Now this sounds like you're a lawyer about to interview a witness. Yeah, um, <laughs> for an AR, right, a lot of times, I mean, straight up, you can't give a card, right? You're, you're not the one giving it. You have to communicate to the HR, they have to stop play, something they then go, go and actually give out the card, right? So no matter what, you have to go through an intermediary to actually stop play and make any kind of foul happen. When doing that, it should be short, sweet, simple, right? Like you need to stick to the point, tell them specifically what you what you saw, right? Um, that play, uh, Peter number seven uh, on Team Black, he, when he was trying to take the ball from Peter number eight on Team White, uh, his arm came in contact with the neck. It should be a yellow card if I think it was egregious or it affected play seriously. It should be a blue card if I think it was very minor accidental and he agitated it, right? But I, and, and I don't think it affected play much, right? So you go up. One point there, just with physical contact fouls, you can't give a blue card, unfortunately. It's either a yellow or it's a back to hoops. Valid. You're, you're, you're very right. Um, so yellow in that case. I'm just on the spot trying to think and I'm not great at remembering all the rules as I'm going quickly, but you know, you're very right. Um, but like, that's my point, right? You go up to him, you go up to the ref and you go, hey, this is a specific thing I call, it should be this card, the end, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't be going, they, they, the head ref should never have to go, are you sure you saw that? Like, step up, confidently say, this is the thing that occurred, this is what should happen. And uh, for speaking concisely, I mean, depending on the head ref, like as a head referee, I want the, the least amount of information that I need to make a call from an AR. Mm -hmm. So um, Laura Ivy is someone who does this a lot and she does it really well. When she stops play for a foul as an assistant referee or asks for play to be stopped, yep. and when she comes up to me, she'll literally just, she'll just say, you know, number 39, black team, contact from behind. And that's it. That's all that, that, that I hear. And I go, okay, great. And then the, the card comes out. Um, Perfect. And then if you add maybe the yellow or the blue, that's also great. But yeah, just the, the more concise you can be and the more confident you can be, the easier it is for the head ref to, to call it. 100%. I think me personally, the reason I say a card afterwards more often than not, um, for me is because I found the last two years, a lot of the times I've been ARing has been at like Northeast regionals or, or games in the Northeast MQC games where the HR is clearly like less experienced or maybe doing a training, things like that. So I'm trying to support a little bit, take a little bit off their plate and like make that decision making process a little simpler. Um, Oftentimes when I have an experienced ref like yourself or like Ethan Sturm or Jake or someone, it'll just be literally, hey, this is the foul, this is the player, and I'll, I'll move away. So I, I do think that's a really good call out. Last but not least. So their last piece of advice here is consistency, which if you've ever heard me talk about the four cornerstones of officiating, this is the most important one. Yep. Uh, I like to finish finish on a high note. It's, it's big, right? Um, you should never find yourself at a point in the game calling a foul on on team A that you completely ignored for team B in the beginning, right? Um, you, you need to be from start to finish of a game and ideally from start to finish of a tournament consistent with the way you are calling the rules. Um, in Quidditch, especially as a beat ref, that can be a little harder because Oftentimes you're focused on one section of beaters and the other beat refs are fo focused on the others because you're, you're kind of splitting up that task management so that everything gets called. Make sure you spend a little bit of time before the game um, actually touching base with the other airs and make sure you're on, on the same page with things like... Um, it's, it's a lot more clear now, but in the past, like a ball rolling off pitch, what should be happening with it? It was a little bit more gray in the past. So that was something I always like to touch base with my ARs about and make sure we're on the same page. Now, the rule is specific, but sometimes people don't know it. So I like to remind them like, hey, you know, if play stops, bring that in the two meters or sorry, two yards. Make sure make sure you're you're paying attention to where it went off pitch and you're you're 100 percent of the time telling somebody it's their ball to go inbound, things like that. Make sure everybody's on the same page with those rules and ready to call them the same way is really important. That's the pre-shift, pre pre-game pre meeting you should be touching base. 
During the game, though, if you hear one of your peers give a warning for something, right? Um, and it may be something that you wouldn't normally give a warning for, um, but whatever, they're giving a warning. Or on the flip side, maybe they aren't giving a warning and you usually would. Mirror that, right? Um, don't let them do it once to one team and then you do your normal thing for the other team and make it imbalanced. Uh, for better or for worse, by doing it the same way, you're giving that consistency so that at least both teams feel they are being treated the same, right? Even if they both feel they're being treated a little bit worse than they should or they're getting away with a little bit more than they should, they know they're both going to get the same treatment and that's super important. Right, if you're consistently calling, I mean, even if you just threw out the Quidditch rulebook and consistently called the rules of basketball, like people could eventually figure out what it is they're supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, but if you are calling the rules of basketball one minute, the rules of Quidditch the next, and then suddenly you're switching to like the wrestling rulebook, people have no idea what's going on. Yeah, players shouldn't have to guess um, if what they're doing is okay or not. Never, they should never have to guess that, right? And I mean, those are extreme examples, but within the rulebook, sure. it's better to be consistently lax or consistently strict than it is to switch between the two mid-game. 100%. Thank you so much, Mario, for giving us these seven steps. I know throughout making this three-part series, I have gotten a lot better at ARing in theory, and I'm actually kind of excited to go out and practice ARing once, once I get the chance to. Please like and subscribe and leave a comment if you have any questions. Join me again on Thursday for my next video. You won't want to miss it. In the meantime, please travel safely, and as always, thank you for watching.